Uh, hello, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Ko Chen Pan from Institute of Astronomy. Uh, thanks very much for giving me this opportunity to start my work. So what I talk today will be many books on this paper we just submitted a few weeks ago. Uh, so uh, Mong Wu already gave a very nice introduction about complex supernovae. And in this talk, uh, I will focus on uh, how stellar mesh black hole form formed through coconut supernovae, and second, what are the multi-messenger signals, including gravitational waves, can be produced through coconut supernovae. So, uh, yeah, so probably all of you already know that this year, the Nobel Prize in Physics is awarded for the black hole studies. First, uh, Roger Penrose actually predicted that black hole should exist and it's the natural outcome from general relativity. And then the other two people, they actually they found that actually in the Milky Way, we, there's a supermassive black hole. So black hole do exist, uh, but these are for supermassive black holes. And they are focusing on stellar mass black hole, which the black hole has a mass around a few solar masses. And uh, also three years ago, uh, the LIGO and the Virgo team actually they do detect uh, black holes from mergers of two black holes. They detect the gravitational wave emission from this kind of merger. So that immediately also awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics. And also we know that uh, in early this year, uh, the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration actually they announced the first image of black hole in this class. So that discovery actually also awarded for this breakthrough prize uh, in, two, in early this year. So this breakthrough prize is also cut out a pre-Nobel Prize uh, award. So that suggests that actually we have entered uh, this gravitational wave astronomy uh, new area. So, and also from uh, LIGO and the Virgo teams, so in the very early time in about 2015 and 2016, there were only a few detectives from binary black hole mergers, but then after some upgrades of the instruments now in O2, there are additional eight more events, including one neutron star neutron star mergers. And also a few weeks ago, uh, like the Virgo team, they announced uh, the first half of the uh, third observations called O3A, uh, which detected uh, an additional 36, 39 events. So in total, now we have 50 gravitational wave events detected, and then there will be lots of work coming from O3B, and also in the future, O4 and O5 and so on. So then that's exciting because a lot of more events uh, will be detected. And also for this plus, summarize uh, the black hole mass through uh, black hole observation from uh, electromagnetic waves. So, and also there are neutron stars. So we do see lots of neutron star and black hole, but now because of the potential wave astronomy, so we do see lots of more events coming. So now in this O3A, so they announced this potential wave transient catalog two. Now we have 50 events and you can see it cover a wide range of black hole masses and so on. So what's the next? So we detect uh, black hole mergers, neutron star mergers, and also for neutron star merger, there's also, also electromagnetic waves counterparts that's also discovered. And also we also detected black hole and neutron star mergers. And what's the next? And from this checklist, you can see that Supernova actually is uh, the very important uh, next milestone if we can detect gravitational wave em emission from cocaine supernova, that will be maybe also very uh, big news. And also for supernovae, uh, in addition to the EM counterparts, we are also expected to detect neutrino emissions because as one who says, through cocaine supernovae, there will be lots of neutrino emitted. So now for supernovae, then we will have detection of gravitational wave, electromagnetic waves, and neutrinos. So these different messengers can also tell 
uh, different story about the same events, but this messenger can be generated through uh, a different region of the same events and also maybe at a slightly different time. So then that can give more constraints about the Phoenix inside. So that's called this multi messenger as a Phoenix. Uh, and this multi messenger as a Phoenix is also growing a lot in recent years. It's because we have lots of new uh, telescopes in the uh, ground based uh, space telescope. Uh, actually, we could see lots of uh, uh, supernovae events and our other transient events uh, every day. And uh, there will be lots of data. And also for the neutrino detectors, as Mongo said, uh, in Supernova 1987 A, which is about 30 years ago, at that time, neutrino detector was not very good, but we still detected a few events. But nowadays, with the neutrino detectors uh, are much improved. And if there's a close by supernova, then we're expected to detect lots of neutrinos, and that can also give lots of constraints on the Phoenix. And also, in a way, uh, Tagra has also joined the LIGO bird observation in early this year. So now we have actually uh, four detectors through three different uh, big projects. So, gravitational wave astronomy is also very uh, an interesting things happening now. And also, uh, for, uh, for, for theory parts, we also have very nice supercomputers recently. Also in Taiwan, we have this Taiwania supercomputers, and also Taiwania 2, which actually now uh, ranked in top 20 in the world. So that is also a very nice supercomputer, which we can now carry very high fidelity uh, Phoenix simulations that includes many detail micro Phoenix. Then I can also give uh, combining all these things, then we can know lots of things. So uh, this is the number of supernovae detected in a function of time. You can see that because of this uh, transients of uh, telescopes, so now we can detect transient events more than one in a day. So we can detect a few a couple of supernovae a day, and you can see the number of supernovae detected uh, increase a lot. So for some facts. Roughly every second in the universe, there's a supernova explodes, and roughly you can detect more than super one supernovae a day. But for a close by supernovae in the Milky Way, uh, the event rate is roughly one to 30 or 50 years. So the event rate uh, is probably not very well, but if we are lucky, we are able to detect radiation waves from cocaine supernovae or from some nearby galaxy in some extreme environments, there's also some chance to detect it. So what's the picture of these uh, multi-messenger signals from Coca-Cola supernovae? So for these pictures, uh, before collapse, uh, we have these onion shell structures, which we have an iron core in the center, surrounded by silicon shell, oxygen shell, and so on. And depending on the initial mass and maybe beta density, rotational rate, and magnetic fields, then the collapse phase could be slightly different. But peak picture is uh, once it collapses and the central density should increase, but when the density reach to the nuclear density, then core will bounce because of this very stiff uh, density. Then we can it, it will reflect, bounce, and launch a shock wave. But this shock wave will lose some energy because of the need to spend some energy to dissociate the ions uh, to free nuclei. And also there are some other inflows from the envelope. So there's a competing between the inflow and the shock wave. So shock wave actually can be stored at some radius. And sometimes we need some physics, usually we call it because of the neutrino mechanism to revive all the shock. But if the shock can revive, then we can get a successful supernova exposure. So if not, then the, it will become a failed supernova. So everything just collapses into a black hole. But for these successful explosion cases, there's also some possibility because of, you can see this shock wave is combating. So there are still some uh, region you can have fall back onto the central neutron star. And this neutron star mass can continue accumulate it and then eventually reach to some limits 
then you can still have a black hole. So let's go the full back black hole formations in this picture. And the important thing is for this collapse phase, it takes less than a second, but uh, this portion actually needs several hours to adapt for the shock wave to reach to the surface of the star that's called a shock breakout. So for shock breakout, there's a delay for a few hours to a day. So if we can detect neutrino in the gravitational wave at this time, then they can be alert for sending some other uh, telescopes saying that uh, there's a supernova we explored in a few hours, please look at that. Then we can see the electromagnetic wave from very early time. So in terms of uh, the messengers, uh, the progenitor of the supernova actually is very bright. They are usually red or blue supergiants, so they are very bright. So we can detect them through some space telescope by looking the pre-exposure imaging. So actually we could see it, but and also after the breakout, we see that our supernovae like a lot. But inside these regions, which shock or everything are happened inside the star. So it's not transparent in the electromagnetic nesting wave. We can also explore the Felix through neutrinos and the gravitational waves. So uh, the neutron star is so dense, then so the neutrino can be transmitted there, and then uh, it will emit lots of the neutrinos because the original, the binding energy of the system, which is about uh, 10 to 53 ergs, and the, like most of the energy actually will release through neutrinos. So they will emit lots of neutrinos in all flavors. And also uh, after core bounce, because of some perturbations under the central neutron star, uh, then this perturbation will also emit gravitational waves. So we are also expecting to, to see the gravitational emission in coconut supernova. Okay. So uh, for, for this image, we can see that uh, if after supernova explosion, we can see there's a star disappear. So by looking at the pre-exposure imagery, we can actually identify the progenitor system. So that's already discovered. Uh, and also we have a few examples for identifying the progenitor of a coconut supernova. And also for the neutrino, so this is the detection of the 1987A. We do detect in neutrinos. And also for this failed supernova, which we don't see explosion, you can see there's a star uh, seen here. But after some times, it is disappeared without seeing a supernova. So that also uh, implies that it could be a failed supernova, which you form a black hole uh, instead of supernova exposure. And for the strike breakout, we need to be very lucky to detect this very early signal. So that's also very challenging because the sky is huge, right? And also our telescope has to be lucky enough to point out to the right location at the right time to see the bridge shock breakout. <laughs> the missing things is the potential wave emission from coconut supernova. So that's, but to understand this, we have to run simulations because as you can see, uh, for if we do detect potential waves from coconut supernova, then it looks like this. You just see lots of signals or noise. How do we know these signals are due to supernova explosion? Then we have to do this through numerical simulations. So let's go back to this picture. We do see a lot of black holes and the neutron star. But if we arrange it in linear scale, you can see there's a very interesting uh, object here. So this is a very massive black hole, which has a mass around uh, 85 per mass. And it merged with another black hole and become a very massive black hole, which has a final mass larger than 100 solar mass. So this is maybe uh, first candidate saying that the intermediate mass black hole, which has mass larger than 100 solar mass, they do exist through mergers. Uh, and also another interesting thing is uh, in the tradition uh, in, in earlier physics. People suggest that the mass range in between roughly this, which we should not expect black hole mass uh, in this range. But we do see this very massive black hole and white size. That's one important thing we want to know. 
And also, if we rearrange this up all these particular objects in terms of mass and then numbers, you can see that there are also many questions we want to know. For example, uh, what is the max limits of a neutron star? So you can see there's a mass gap, which we don't know the maximum mass of a neutron star is about two solar mass or three solar mass or something in between. Uh, or even so in this region. So, and also what is the nuclear equation state of a neutron star? So what is the mass and radius relationship? Because the radius actually describes how the region of the perfection and that also should reflect on gravitational waves. And also how to form the black hole, uh, how to form this mass. So that are, these are important questions we want to answer. And we will try to answer maybe not of them, but uh, one of them uh, through a new maker simulation. So how to, before to understand how to form black hole, we also want to know how to get supernova explosion. So then that's because of, then we have to know, understand the supernova engines. So the picture is that you have an iron cross collapse to a neutron star. So uh, because the density is so high in these regions, then the electron capture process should happen. So in electron captures, then you have an electron plus a proton, and become a neutron. So that's why this is called a neutron star because it becomes a very neutron rich environment and then it emits lots of neutrinos. So uh, these neutrinos carry most of the energy. The idea is if a few percent of neutrinos energy are actually absorbed by matter again, then this reabsorption should provide enough energy per budget to power the explosion. Because the explosion energy is about only 10 to 50 watts, Earth's the neutrinos carries 10 to 53, so it's 100 times uh, higher than the kinetic energy we observe. So the picture is like this, so this is called the neutrino mechanism. So that means uh, we have to not only do this uh, collapse simulation, but have to couple this hydrodynamics part with neutrino physics and also the nuclear physics. So to do this is actually very numerical challenging because it involves all kinds of physics, including uh, hydrodynamics and magnetohydrodynamics because we know pulsar that have strong magnetic field. So that means at some points, magnetic fields could, import, could be play and very important roles. And also we have to include general relativity because black hole and neutron star is compact objects they have to consider GR. And also neutrino physics and nuclear physics, because for these nuclear matters, we have to include the nuclear physics, that's how to that's describe the nuclear equation of states, and also the neutrino interactions that involves the weak physics. So basically all four fundamental forces are involved in these simulations. And also to calculate the neutrino emissions, we have to also solve the neutrino transport equation because it covers the wide optical uh, depth range in the supernova condition, which we have some region like neutrinos are trapped at the central neutron star, but also some regions, uh, the neutrino could be transparent and they will emit away. So we have to solve this Pontman transport equations, which is a seven dimensional equation because we have three dimensions in space, two dimension in the scattering angles, one dimension in energy and additional dimension in time. So these seven dimensional equations is actually very numerically challenging. So some approximating schemes are still necessary at this moment. And there are some additional complexity uh, due to multi-dimensional effects because uh, if we want to see gravitational waves, uh, it must be multi-dimensional, right? Because monopole doesn't has gravitational emissions. So if we include multi-dimensional effects, such as rotations, then convection and turbulence will be happened as well. So that involves lots of both uh, fluids and the edge the uh, instabilities could happen uh, inside supernova conditions. So that makes things actually much more complicated. And also it covers a very wide density range from the central neutron star is about 10 to 14 grams per centimeter cubic, but the outer regions of the envelope 
could be only 10 to 4, 10 to 5, so it covers maybe around 10 order of magnitude difference in density. And also we need to have very high accuracies because the neutrino energy is about 100 times higher than kinetic energy, so we need to have accuracy uh, better than maybe a percent. So that makes things, everything very complicated and numerically expensive. So what's in, included in that? Then here I show you some picture uh, which of our simulation that you can have a failed explosion and a successful explosion on the right. So now you can see after Corbin's first electric shock wave uh, of this blue thing there, you can see there's a shock wave and then conversion happens uh, and then travels some turbulence, but this shock wave actually was still stored at the end then you don't get a successful supernova explosion. But on the right, there's some chance for in here, we include some additional rotation. You can see because of the rotation that help to redistribute the angular momentum, then this convection can help the star to explode and get a successful supernova explosion. So then once we have these two ready, then we can study how to form black holes. So uh, for this candidate of this failed supernova, uh, actually it happened in about in 2009, we find a small outburst which has a luminosity of beyond 10 to 6 solar luminosity, but this is not bright enough as a supernova. And then it slightly fade away uh, without a supernova explosion. And then at the end, you can see this star disappeared without seeing a supernova. So this is uh, some hints about Fail supernova, which you form a uh, black hole, but there's no uh, supernova in EM waves. But this should also emit gravitational waves and also neutrinos. So in that case, we also have some chance to detect the gravitational wave and the neutrino from this kind of event. So, so what kind of mass of the super protrator star can produce black holes? So traditionally, if you read the textbooks, the textbook will tell you that uh, if the mass is roughly between A to 20 solar mass, you will form a neutron star, and if it's above 20, then you will form black hole. But this picture is actually wrong because uh, if you consider the detailed detail structure of this star at the core regions, you can see that it's actually not monotonics, and actually there's a parameter called the companies parameter can better describe the structure of the core region, how compact they are. And uh, if the core is very compact, then you have more likely to form black hole instead of neutron star. And this companies parameter is not monotonic in mass. So the better picture should be look like this. You have some islands region, which you could have black hole formations, but also some region we can form neutron stars. So we also so we pick out one progenitor, which is this 40 solar mass progenitor around this region. Oops. Oops. And do this supernova simulation. First, we do this in 1D and 2D. We can find that. Here on the left, I show you the average shock radius evolution. You can see only for one case, <coughs> excuse me, in the end, <coughs> you get a super successful supernova explosion. Now for other cases, all the shock won't revival. So that means you, you get a failed supernova. And on the right, you, see, you can see the central density evolution. At the time zero, there's a core bounce. So you have peak at here, but because of the continuous intro, that's it. The central density can actually continue to increase. And at the end, there's a second collapse. So that's a time which black hole form. And this black hole formation time actually is sensitive to the nuclear equation of state and sensitive to the dimension. You can see if you have multiple dimensions, then black hole formation time will decrease. So that means if you have a delayed black hole formation, then you can emit more neutrinos and also the potential wave messengers will be different. So in this paper, actually we extend this 
to 3D simulations for the same progenitors. And here, just some summary of some technical details. Probably you don't need to pay attention on this. But the idea is we use the stem projector for this solar mass projector, but consider the effects on rotations. So we include three different rotational rates, including the original no rotating cases, and also a slow rotating cases, and the fast rotating cases. So you can see that from these movies, they, are, uh, they have very different outcomes depending on the rotational rates. So for the fair rotating rates, uh, slow rotate, not long rotating rates, uh, which is the green lines, you can see the shock is not revival, so you have a fair supernova, uh, and then shock rate is just a very less than 100 kilometers, and you get a black hole formation. And in 3D, it's actually not too different with 2D, which is this thin line, but you do see the black hole formation. But very interesting case is this blue line, which is the slow rotating cases, you have a successful supernova explosion, so you can see the shock revival happen at around uh, 600 milliseconds for spawns. So the shock radius actually increasing, and then you can get a successful explosion. And thank you very much. And you also see black hole formations together at the same time. So you have a, uh, so this, this case is kind of this four by mechanism. You have explosion and black hole formation together. And for this best rotating case, you can see because of its strong rotations, you see a very early explosion. So shock rate is increased pretty fast, and then we get successful explosion, but we don't see black hole formation at this time. And also because we consider neutrino transport, so we can also predict the neutrino emissions in terms of luminosity and also energy in different species. So, uh, the, so, so the solid lines is for electron neutrino, the H lines are for uh, electron anti neutrinos, and the uh, uh, dotted lines are for uh, mu and tau neutrinos, and they are anti neutrinos. You can see, depending on when they explode, so if you have a early explosions, then the neutrino luminosity will decrease because you don't have enough accretion to power this neutrino luminosity. But for the field supernova, because of this uh, continuous secretion, then you can have very high neutrino luminosity for very long times. And for this uh, next explosion case for the blue lines, you can see once it explodes, the neutrino luminosity also drops. And for the energies, and if you have continuous accretion, then you can see this energy can continuously increase from about 10 AeV and then at the end can go up to 20 or 25 AV. But for this uh, successful explosion, the energy range is, uh, is low I mean, compared to for other exploding cases. So uh, if you look at the central neutron star region, which is showing in this contour, white contour, and that's all the color represent the radial velocity, you can see the neutron star inside actually is convective. So there's a neutron star convection, and these convections will perturb the neutron star. And then just like us cracks, then this perturbation should emit gravitational waves. So we can also analyze the, the moment of initial changes in this simulation. Then we can predict the gravitational emissions. And here we assume if the supernova has a distance about 10 kiloparsecond, then you can see the gravitational strength actually is depending on the rotation. In here, we only show the first 15 milliseconds. You can see there's a very clear bounce signal at around four bounce. And this bounce signal is depending on the rotational rate. If you have a very fast rotation, then you can have very strong bounce signal. And then after around uh, 10 milliseconds, there's a region called the prime convection, which you have a convection uh, around the neutron star surface around uh, 90 to kilo kilometers. Then this prime convection will also see signals. And if you look longer, then this signal has initially uh, about 100 kilohertz frequency. And then this frequency can continue to increase. So in here, we do some free transform. To get us oh, okay to get a spectrograms, 
then you can see the frequency actually increased a lot from a few hundred hertz to up to 2000 hertz in the end. And also there are some other features uh, through some other perturbation in different modes. You can see here there's a space strong uh, signal at, at around a few hundred hertz. Later on, I will explain uh, what is this signal actually is due to some fluid speeds called steady accretion shine speed. So you can see this condition wave picture is very different with the merger cases because in mergers, basically you just have rotate uh, revolution of two, of two stars and the signal is quite clear. You just see the frequency increasing and then after merge, then there's a ring down. But you can see that in supernova uh, perpetual way, it's much more complicated because it's not only a point black hole, but also lots of matters and perturbation through its ability. So these features are quite complicated. And also depending on the rotational rate and also some depending on some other physics as well. So you can see if you, there's no rotation, you see there's a peak neutron star oscillation uh, around here. This is also true in the slow rotating cases, but because in the slow rotating cases, uh, there's some rotation, then you have a delay of this black hole formation. You can see the growth of the peak neutron star frequency is also changing. And also the sub feature due to flames through in speedy is also different with the non-rotating cases. And for like this fast rotating cases, you can see the feature is also very different. You have a very loud gravitational wave happens uh, at this region, and this is low frequency. And for this case, it's very good because uh, the sensitivity window of light on the Virgo are like in this few hundred hertz window. For this case, actually it's very promising to detect the gravitational emission by LIGO, Virgo, and Kagura network. So probably you have heard uh, this gravitational wave sound from, this, from black hole merger. So now I will also play the gravitational wave sound from uh, supernovae. So now, Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, anyway, I can just ignore that part. Yeah, so, okay. So unfortunately I cannot show you the sounds, uh, but you can see that from these spectral grains, mm -hmm. the sounds of conventional emission from supernovae uh, could be very different uh, as mergers. And also they have these sub features, which we hope uh, if we can detect this, then they can give additional constraints on the supernova physics. Okay, so because I don't have too much time, it meant two minutes. So, uh, so here is the instability called the SASI, which stands for the standing pressure instability. You can see there's the starship motions, which surround by around this central neutron star in this purple color. And this study can actually reproduce through water experiments. So this is actually a natural flow instability in supernova. So this SASI, you can see, oops, because of this slash motion, it can redistribute the angular momentum. So in here, I show you some spin axis of the, uh, of the proton neutron star, and also from the SASI in the color dots, you can see there's some anti-correlation between the neutron star spin and also the SASI direction. So even from initial non-rotating cases, the neutron star can be spin up due to SASI. And, the, and if the star actually eventually explodes, then you can result in a rotating neutron star as well. So you can see the neutron star can be spin up uh, and then even for the non-rotating cases. So I can also explain for example, for some uh, milliseconds, pulsar, we do see a lot in the natures. So this is, could be some mechanism to spin out a neutron star. 
And also this study should also provide some computational feature, which if we do free transfer of this study axis, we can see some, some, some overlapping between of the uh, fundamental modes and also the second modes. And here we only show the L equal to one mode from the study. And now the, uh, this signal might also be related to the L equal to two modes. And you can see that this study feature can generate very high, fre low frequency gravitational feature, which is uh, good for LIGO and Virgo. So then the final part of my talk, I will focus on whether we can detect this kind of supernovae. So uh, we can first, we can just compare our question way in uh, from the simulation with uh, LIGO 03, 04, or in the future 04, 05, and also even for the Einstein telescope uh, about the sensitivity curves. But here you can see that uh, if we place lens uh, in Gaiety supernova, then we can definitely observe lens. Uh, but for the detailed structure, if we conduct this uh, coherent wave first analyze, you can see for the non rotating cases, actually the high frequency signal, we cannot detect it because just simply the sensitivities are bad uh, of LIGO and Virgo. But this very bright, uh, low frequency region actually could be robust. And for the slow rotating cases, we can see there's a strong bound signal, but other than for this high frequency signal, there's not much change if the signal to noise ratio is 30. And for, but for the fast rotating cases, you can see even for the signal to noise ratio is 30, it, it is very loud in this 500 Hertz signal. So we have a high, very high chance to detect it. And then in terms of the distance limits, you can see that for these fast rotating cases, we can actually detect it up to uh, 100 kiloparsecs. That's actually very good. And then actually this limit is further than the LNC, which is about uh, 500, 550 kilometers per sec. And also this limit actually is also beyond, I think, neutrino detector limit. So for these fast rotating cases, actually it's quite interesting. Uh, and if there's some close by supernova explosion, then we should be able to detect it. So because of the time limit, I will just stop here and take your questions. Thank you very much. Since you already showed the uh, So uh, the gravitational wave strength magnitudes are much stronger than supernovae. So for uh, neutron star neutron star merger, actually the detection limits can be beyond megaparsec. But for a supernova, uh, still like kiloparsec order, so it's much weaker. So we only we can only detect it in nearby supernovae. We can have one another question. So you mentioned that some part of the gravitational signals can be generated by the convection inside the photon neutron stars. Yeah. I'm just wondering um, in realistic environment, will there be any viscosity positive possible by the magnetic field? Can it be there? And how long it can uh, reach over? Uh, I think that so actually uh magnetic field actually helps uh Convection because uh, there could be some magnetic rotational instability developed. So that instability can drive further turbulence but inside. To small scale. Uh -huh. it small scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the small scale. Uh, so you, you mean on the um,
Yeah, but the, so, so then your question is so you wonder, like, uh, uh, how, how uh -huh. lightly this kind of effect. Uh -huh. so, yeah, how lightly, you know, how important it is to improve uh, yes, uh, there could be some, uh, but how important how that affects the the convention waste trends? I think it's unclear because actually in here we have some numerical viscosity already, and also our results actually is kind of sensitive with the resolution. So that is true. So in terms of uh, strength, uh, it could be affected through this uh, uh, viscosity, uh, but the frequency won't be too strange because the frequency is mainly dominated by the neutron star structure, which won't be too affected by conversion or something else. I think we have to stop here and move on. Let's thank uh, the